So without further ado, I'm going to turn off my slides and, uh, and give me a moment to do that. Stop sharing. And uh, let's see. So Peng, we're going to turn the table over to you first. Unmute yourself and you can uh, begin to share. Okay. Thank you, Craig. Uh, yep. Hey, everybody. Thank you for allowing me to do some sharing today. So I'm going to share my screen so I can talk about the PowerPoint here. Uh, if I can find it now. <laughs> there it is. Um, let me see here. There we go. So what I'm going to talk about is really like the crossroads of class, race, and gender and globalization, um, particularly in the Hmong and Khmer community, which is the Cambodian community. Um, and much of our work is really like uh, local, but it's also like very global as well because of the uh, the separation of families uh, and communities across um, different continents, right? So I think that for our work, it couldn't be only like that. We would only be engaging the men here only uh, that live here in the U.S., but that we had to go back home to our home countries and also do work there as well, too. And so I'll talk more about what that looks like and what I really mean by that. I think that mo so much of the work that we do stems from understanding the lived experiences and lives of women and girls in our uh, respective and different communities. And so much of our work is informed by uh, the folks that you see in this picture, right? Mon women that are globally, not just here in the US, but those who live in Laos, uh, Thailand, uh, China, Vietnam, and France. Uh, and so this is really a picture from a global summit that we had. And so that we needed to understand that diversity uh, and those lived experiences. And that no matter where our sisters came from, that they had a shared understanding and narrative around what patriarchy looks like in our community and how it manifests in each of our, our community, right? And that the context of each of our different uh, diaspora community within the Hmong community is really different as well. Um, and so being able to think about like that, some of the solutions that we have here in the U.S may not work necessarily in Thailand. And some of the solutions that work in Laos may not work necessarily in France, right? So being able to think about it in that global way and being able to say, how can we connect back to working with those folks as well? Uh, and so with that, I wanna show a video of like, what does that mean in terms of engaging men on a global level uh, in the Hmong community and in the Khmer community, right? Uh, so we, a while back, uh, fellow within our group had created this um, video. If I could pull it up here. Let me see if I can pull it up here. He had created this video, um, this spoken word piece, and he had given it or shared it with us. And so I want to show this piece to all of us. They say to be a real man, we break bottles, crush beer cans, take shots of 151. All night we force friends and family to keep drinking, stop thinking, drown misery and emotion in alcohol oceans, swerving around highways and streets, let them be. We all have different degrees of tolerance. One man's drunk is another man's death. To be a real man, raise your voice, yell when you get pissed off, put them down, make them feel like trash, threaten them with death, curse them out and bring up the past, hurt them more, diminish their spirits, scream like a lion's roar, in pain when a foot gets caught in a steel trap. To be a real man, push bodies, snatch arms, pound chests, squeeze necks, smash fingers, smack faces, show dominance through violence, brutality, and power. Hold them down and don't let them get up. You are in love with the feeling of making others feel lower than you. So rip your shirt off like clothing caught on fire or provoking Bruce Banner. To be a real man, control your wife, keep your girlfriend in check. Let her know who is the man, the boss with the pants, put her in her place. In the kitchen, 
dad slaps, shoves, and stomps mom in front of their five-year-old son's wide eyes with tears dripping down his chin over the years until he himself becomes a man. This is who he has to look up to, experience to grow up through. What will stop him from following in his father's footsteps? Why would we allow this cycle to continue? Hey bro, man up. You need to be a man, a real man. We always feel this need to prove we are a man. What makes us men? We will not be defined by how violent we can be. Back in high school, we got checked and disrespected. A manhood was tested by other young men with something to prove between classes on the daily. Pissed off, so we obsess and strategize retaliation with our friends and fists. Like, man, I'm going to get him back for what he did to me. So we are socially conditioned at a young age to have visions of violence. I understand why a man might have destructive tendencies and become blind to consequences. It's rooted in me by bullies growing up as a teen watching beatdowns and guns blasting on TV, movies on big screens, music videos. Media has a massive influence on what we perceive a man should be. When the youth see them and grow to copy this behavior, we need to make a difference. Take time to listen. Women have their own stories they're living in. Make time to pick up your child and raise them up to the sun. Collaborate for peace amongst men with handshakes and hip hop hugs. We can be separated by education, economics, and generations. We can be united by opportunities to dream. When we don't see enough men like us succeed, expand our ways of thinking. The next time you raise your voice, speak up for community. Next time you raise your fist, Protest and justice. Our mission is to connect to our sister's vision. Prepare meals and cook. When love is hungry, I feel passion with madness. It's the only way to fully embrace action and ambition. So keep moving. A good man gives back. Volunteers after school to nurture young minds for future potential in communities where there are little to no positive role models. To the construction worker, the graffiti MC, the bus driver, the prize fighter, the poet, the auto mechanic, the Sunday preacher, the organizer, office worker, filmmaker, cable repairman, computer engineer, b-boy, singer, soccer coach, musician, the school teacher, and so on. When they say man up, we can say man forward. Stand up to think forward about what it means to be a man. We can challenge our brothers to change, not reacting with beatdowns, anger redirected to creativity and achievement. Slow down, lower your tone, breathe deep, and talk to me. It's important for me to hear every word you have to say. We can take risks to have these uncomfortable conversations between us to speak, vent, and be heard, and truly believe we can bring out the best in each other. We can sacrifice our egos to settle, heal, and counsel conflicts of the past, looking forward to a future where we believe in possibilities to uplift what we as men can become. We can remove the mask of masculinity to inspire younger generations. We want to live in a world where our fears are not passed down to our children. So that's just like for us, it really means uh, being able to talk about these things in our community is like when we engage the men in our community, it's really getting them to um, think about having good gender lens and what does it mean to have a good gender lens and a good analysis around these things and the issues and the experiences that the women and girls in our community really sort of uh, are experiencing with regards to gender-based violence. And so what that means is that in terms of being able to go back, uh, for some of you in terms of being able to share this and understand why we're doing this work in a global way and that we couldn't just do it here locally is because, um, if I could go to the next page here, let's see if I could, oops, wrong way, wrong direction. Um, it really started here, right? It really started in, in these three countries. And these three countries have a significance in terms of the shared narrative uh, with the U.S.'s policy in um, Southeast Asia in the early 1960s, right, about containment and about uh, communism and about the spread of communism. And so these three countries, uh, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, 
um, through that, created a shared narrative around being refugees. And folks that came here to the US uh, from these three countries were put into the most um, poorest neighborhoods uh, with very little support um, and really li little infrastructure on how to build their lives, right? So it was important for us that as we engage the men in our community, in the Hmong community, and that when we work with uh, the men in the Khmer community, that we really come to this shared narrative uh, around like this diaspora of the U.S.'s engagement in uh, Southeast Asia and what that really meant for our different communities and families uh, that were separated and torn because of that, uh, those policies, right? Um, and so you have like these two very different communities that we're working with who share this same narrative. Uh, you have the Khmer folks who are also um, being deported back home, the men gen in general, a lot of young men who were born in refugee camps or uh, were born uh, in their home country and they were five or six and then they came here to the U.S. Same thing with the Hmong diaspora at the same time as well too, right? So you would have folks uh, like my generation, the 1.5 generation that was born uh, overseas or in refugee camps and then came here to the U.S. and was settled here and are refugees. So that's really different from some of these East Asian experiences here in the U.S. where uh, their families may have been here for generations, right? And, and so through this shared experience and narrative, uh, in these two communities is where we do our work and the work with uh, the men in those communities and what it means to actually push them to have a good gender lens and a good analysis. But the nuances are very different in both communities and that's what I'm gonna talk about is what are those nuances as we engage the men in different, these different communities, right? So first, in the Hmong community, it's really about being able to understand that uh, Hmong folks wanted to go back home. They wanted to go back to Laos and Thailand reconnect with their families there, right? And so a lot of men went back and a lot of women went back too. But like about 10 years ago or 12 years ago, uh, the Wisconsin Hmong advocates who were working on domestic violence and sexual assault figured out and knew that the men were disappearing, right? The women were coming to them and saying, my husband disappeared for a month. Uh, I don't know where he went, he's gone, uh, or he's calling me and he's saying he's in Laos. Right, so about 10 years ago, this sort of new phenomenon came about, which we're sort of, we, um, after doing some work, we called abusive international marriages and relationship, right? So being able to understand that the men were going back and no longer were they going back to have relationships back home with their families and connecting with their families, but they were going back home and teaching, um, the community back there, how, particularly the women and girls, how to have relationships with them when they were for coming from first world country, right? So when you come from first world country and you go to a third world country, you can actually exploit those folks and say, hey, this is how we want to have relationships with you. And we're coming, uh, and, we have, and the perception from those who are living in a third world country is that you're coming from the US, you must have a lot of money, right? even though these men didn't have a lot of money. Uh, but that was the perception, was that they sort of um, said that, yeah, I do, and therefore I'm going to teach you how to have relationships, right? So no longer did it become about building relationships and reuniting with family. It became about exploiting uh, the relationships there with the women and girls, and particularly a lot of younger uh, girls that were living in Laos and Thailand, and the men were doing that. and. And we call it abusive international marriages. We don't call it trafficking or sex trafficking because what happens is that, um, there's a couple nuances in there, is that what that means is then, it means that the parents who are actually uh, pushing and, and pushing their daughter to get married to this gentleman is then becomes the ones who are trafficking their daughter, right? Because it's not that. And then the daughters also believe that they're legitimately getting into a marriage. And why this becomes significant and what's abusive about it is that you have men who are in their 60s and 70s marrying uh, girls who are in their teens, 15, 16 years old, right? So that is the abusive dynamic that we're talking about. Uh, and that's what makes it abusive, right? She comes here um, and she no longer um, 
has any family relationships here or she doesn't have any relationships here. And he's the one that dictates how she lives her life here once she arrives in the US. So uh, this came about uh, in the last uh, 10 years or so with the help of the Wisconsin advocates, uh, home domestic violence advocates who coined this term and who said that we cannot say that the folks and the woman being brought here are trafficked because then that puts those women and girls in a different position in the community, right? If they are being seen as quote unquote prostitutes um, being exploited, then there's no community protection for them. Families won't, they'll be seen as outcasts. So, but if they're seen as wives and daughters, then that there is a sense of uh, protection there, there for them, right? Because families can still hold the guy, the man accountable for this. So one of the questions you may wonder is like, why is it that they're able to do this because they're marrying people who are under age, right? Because the age gap is so big. Is that when you live in the countryside and when you live in communities where you don't track birth and date the same way that we track it here in the U.S. Uh, through um, a logical or through a linear way in terms of calendars and times like that, time isn't kept that way. Time is kept through spaciousness around like harvest season, around like events, right? So when people don't keep track of birth dates like that, what happens is that when they apply for a fiance visas at the U.S. Embassy, the U.S. Embassy may say, you look a little bit young, but we, all we could do is go back to your village and say, is this the correct date of birth? And most of the time, what, what, what could potentially have happened was that many of the chiefs or um, governors of that um, province or of that village would be like, yes, that person is of age because they may, maybe have been paid off already. Right. So that's what we're looking at within the Hmong community is that when we needed to go back and really say the men that are coming overseas from the U.S., that they needed to really think about uh, those relationships that they're uh, getting involved in. Right. So we have to engage the men here, but we also have to go over there and teach the men over there that you need to also be holding those men who are coming from overseas accountable as well. And you need to also stop exploiting uh, your daughters and the woman in your, uh, who are in your care or who are in relationship to you as well. And I hope that that makes sense just because um, of timing. So it's a, it, we could talk a whole day about what this whole abusive international marriages looks like and the relationships that are involved in it because it's so intricate and it's so complex. Um, and so part of this is being able to talk with the men overseas and in different parts of the country and the world because uh, it's not only the U.S. men who are going overseas, right? It is men from France who are going over. Um, it is men from China who are going over as well uh, into Laos and into Thailand and having these uh, relationships that are abusive with the Hmong women and girls there, right? So being able to engage those men as well and uh, being able to say, hey, this is a global phenomenon and it's not just something that is happening only here in the US or is happening only in Laos and Thailand only. Um, and then I'm mean, gonna switch frame a little bit. I, I think when we talk about um, working with Khmer folks, it's a little bit different because what happens is that with Khmer men is that uh, the immigration piece and the gender piece with that is that many of those men and boys that I was talking about, right, who were born in refugee camps or who were born and then came over, is that now they come over, um, they committed a crime, it could be of any range, but in immigration court they're saying they, these folks are criminals and so they've served their time and then now they get deported back. And so now they get deported back to a country where they've never known. A language, some of them don't even speak Khmer or, or Cambodian. And so this is what happens is that they go to a country where they've never lived before. They don't know anybody there. And the other part is that they're being torn and separated by their families again, right? So you see a repeat of trauma that has happened in the 1960s and then now you're seeing it in present day as well in terms of families being torn. So with that, I wanted to share this video um, with, that speaks to that part 
um, about that here. Let me see if I can escape this. Oops. We first came to America in 1985, and uh, like with everybody's story that came from Cambodia during that time was coming from the Khmer Rouge, running away from Khmer Rouge, uh, into the refugee camps and everything. Sophia was born, was he born? born in Cambodia. Yeah, Sophia was born in Cambodia. He Sorry. was born in the middle, <laughs> basically while we were running, while our family's running in the concentration camps. From hearing stories of how he was like basically raised during that time was probably the roughest time because food was really savory. Like it was just, you know, if you end up because you can't, you're hungry, you're thirsty, and my parents sacrificed their own hunger, their own thirst, just so we can do that. Come to America not speaking English. Oops. Sorry. Find the video here. sort of shed a spotlight on some of the human rights issues that are happening in the Northeast region part of the country. We first came to America in 1985 and uh, like with everybody's story that came from Cambodia during that time was coming from the Khmer Rouge, running away from Khmer Rouge, uh, into the refugee camps and everything. Sophia was born, was he born? Born in Cambodia. Yeah, Sophia was born in Cambodia. He Sorry. was born in the middle of <laughs> basically while we were running, while our family was running in the concentration camps. From hearing stories of how he was like basically raised during that time was probably the roughest time because who was really savory, like it was just, you know, you end up in the refugee camp, you're hungry, you're thirsty, and my parents sacrificed their own hunger, their own thirst, just so we can do that. Yeah. Come to America not speaking English and going to school, you know, we didn't understand nothing, and we were just getting picked on every day, every week, every day. It was just hard, it was hard. Our brother Sopat, who was deported, he spent six years upstate prison. And from there, he went straight to immigration um, prison as well. Sat there for about seven months, then got deported. Well, he was basically in his car, just came back from a party, got pulled over by the police, and basically just got a gun in his car, which one of his friend left from like the previous night, he did not know anything about it, and you know, he's not called for it. And just because it, it was in his car, it was it. You know, can't be true to the trial, he lost, and he paid for it. They gave him the maximum sentence for the gun, which is five to ten years, and he served that time. But as far as being deported, you know, that was the whole different story. We don't we don't really talk about it. We just keep going. Our our our, our goal was just to keep going. We never really talked about this type of stuff because it's like the more that we do it's talk about it, it's very sensitive to us. We we're, we we all in our we, we all just sit in the corner and just cry and do it to ourselves. The parents worked hard. You know they they, they ran from the killing field to America to escape Cambodia. Know, and, and only to see one this time return back. And it's it's never a good thing when you're you're ordered to be you know divided from your family. You know, I mean it's not it's not right at all.
so I, there's a whole series on that that you could look online for. Um, it's NBC um, Asian American that actually produced this whole 30 minute uh, sort of a, a documentary about um, the, the deported diaspora of uh, Khmer folks back to Cambodia. Um, <clears throat> and so for us, what it meant was that when we went to fight for justice for these folks, right, most of them were Khmer men, as you can see in this room, that, that in terms of being able to get them to come back into the U.S. and be united with their families again, right, that, that they needed to come back with a good gender lens and that we couldn't just say, hey, we're going to fight for you and we're going to end deportation because it's bad and it's inhumane and it's a, it separates families and it tears families apart. And we've had that experience already in our history. But that when you come back to the U.S., you have a good gender lens and that you don't commit domestic violence and you don't commit sexual assault. Um, and so that is the intersection. I think that if I haven't shared it is really the work where we work with these two communities is really at those intersections, right, of race, class, and gender, is that because many of the uh, women and girls in these two communities, uh, their lives are at that, uh, those crossroads of race, class, and gender. Um, and that folks have, because of the whole immigration thing, uh, folks are being deported back or folks have the ability to go back, like in the Hmong community, Hmong men having the ability to go back and have these relationships that are abusive uh, overseas, or for the Khmer men, it's being deported back and then going to a country where you have no relationship to or no knowledge about, and you can't even speak the language as well. Um, so for us in Man Forward, it's really being able to say, yes, we could do our work locally here, but there's a global aspect to it as well, being able to go back to our own home countries and really engaging with those that are going back there uh, because of the globalization part. And the globalization part is the ability to be able to travel back because uh, the US, uh, the passport that you have in the US here is opens the doors to many uh, opportunities and to many countries where you can go and teach people how to have relationships with you. Even for folks who've been deported back, uh, the perception is for for those who have families back there the perception from their families is like why are you here why are you coming back right or why are you here in cambodia when your family's overseas um and you're young and we don't know why you're returning so there's uh, some shame that is involved in that as well and so in engaging those men it's like building their analysis around gender as well um and then getting them to uh, if they are coming back, that when you do come back, you're going to show up in a different way in the community, right? So um, that is the work that we do. And I know I'm low on time, but um, it's very brief. And so I hope that all of you understood and was able to understand what I was talking about in terms of like that the work that we do in Man Forward is always at those intersections. Um, and that uh, it was very different kind of work in each community because of the nuances in each community. So I'll leave it sort of there. Thanks, Peng, really appreciate it. So there's a few minutes that we can, we have time for one, maybe two questions, and then we'll switch over. Um, and we'll have more time after, towards the end, we'll save time for, for other questions as well that could be addressed to you. So, um, Stephen or Magali, do you see a question or two, or is anyone in the audience would like to uh, jump, jump in, just raise your hand? Uh, this is Stephen. Um, I, I have a question, thank, thank you, that was really r fascinating. Um, and I'm curious how the men have responded um, in the two communities that you are working in? Um, so it's very different because most of the men that we are engaging uh, to change the practices in terms of um, in the Hmong community, uh, they're mostly elderly men, and so they're quite resistant to that change. Um, but I think the men that we've engaged overseas who live overseas 
uh, and the elderly men there, they're quite supportive uh, and, and they understand. And so, um, because they haven't been through, I think, as much changes uh, in their life as those who've been uh, refugees and who came here to the US, especially the ones in Thailand. Um, so they haven't experienced as much traumatic things. And so they've been quite supportive of our efforts and really support like that men need to really have a good uh, gender equity lens uh, and that men need to stop uh, these practices that are bad. And it's, especially in this one conversation I had with an elderly uh, man there, he said, we need to stop making up practices, right? And making up rules that uh, allow for men to keep dominating. Right. And so that was really important. I think for the Khmer men uh, who've been deported and in term their younger population, uh, they are mostly in their late 20s uh, to mid 30s and 40s. And so that community is and most of them have been involved in like gangs, um, have been affiliated with gangs, um, have lived uh, an impoverished life. Right. Um, coming from poor communities. And so it's a little bit harder for them to wrap their head around this gender piece, right? Because they're so masculine and they're so macho in many of uh, their portrayals of what it means to be masculine. And so being able to have yeah. them sort of turn that around is, is still a challenge because we have to bring a lot of, like what we say, bring a lot of feminine energy into the space. Uh, so it's still a little bit more challenging in that respect. And because I don't, I'm not from the community, so I have to work with those who are here in the U.S. Um, who are in the community so that they can go and engage. So I'm there as an ally more so in that space. Thank you. Laxman has his hand up. I'm just unmuted you, Laxman. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Fame. It was wonderful, uh, you know, listening about your wonderful work. I just wanted to you know, get a sense of um, building on Steve's question. Uh, is you know I see a lot of age uh, difference in groups as well. So uh, have you found any differences in terms of how older men respond and younger men respond to, to the work you are doing or during the engagement? Yes, um, I think that. Um, the difference responses, particularly I think in, in the Hmong community, the community that I come from, is that the men who are in positions of power are most resistant to the change. Uh, it is usually our clan leaders, it is usually the ones who hold like um, spiritual positions. They're most resistant to the change. Um, it is men who, and younger men who are in, in college uh, who are educated that are most um, open to that change. Uh, and then there's just a mix of both of those two <laughs> after that. Um, I think there are men in, in our community who are old uh, and who are elders, but they often, um, after a series of conversations with them, especially those in my domestic violence group, they will then eventually open up and say, hey, yes, we do get what you're saying now, you know? But part of it is because so much of uh, the Hmong community is dictated by these invisible rules and structures of what it means to be Hmong and what it means to be men uh, and women. And that's what we're trying to lift up and make more visible for folks. Uh, Nicholas has a question. Do we have time for another question, Craig? Um, let's see, I guess, uh, yeah, Nick, why don't you frame your question as briefly as you can, and we'll, we'll take the one question, and then we'll go on to Alan. Thank you. Go ahead. Hey, um, I hope you can hear me. Yes. I'm, I'm uh, particularly interested because I work internationally with masculinity, and I was in Cambodia and uh, Vietnam a couple of years ago, and I think it's a really interesting program. I congratulate you to, for doing that. But I, I get a little confused because you talk appropriately about the importance of the family and the couples and, and, the, and the parents to the kids. And, and I'm wondering, why do you talk about men so much? Are you separating the men away from the family and from the women? And, 
and how do you it's an old question for the mm. those of us working with men in different countries and different cultures how much do we want to separate the men and it's a long discussion so we probably oh. can't get into it now but i just want to get to it maybe later okay well if i could answer like the short version of it is that for or particularly for us in the Hmong community, especially in that global conference that we had, where we gathered a hundred Hmong women from different parts of the world to come and talk, right? We only had like five or six men that I've shown in those photos. And men can be really destructive in those spaces. So one, one particular gentleman from France, he could totally take the whole narrative of that conference and say that this is actually what happened there, right? So I think that that's partially part of the reasons why we we push men to have these conversations separate from women, but for men to also be in those spaces to listen as well. And the other part of it is that the the women do ask that we do have our own separate conversations and that we do do our own work, and that when we do show up in their spaces that we are less invisible and less visible uh, because they needed to build sisterhood in that way as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Peng, it's wonderful. I have this feeling I want to go on to have this conversation. So mm -hmm. with that said, we're gonna switch over to Alan and have him present, and then we'll save a few minutes at the end for further questions. So Alan, do you wanna jump in? Unmute yourself and do your thing? Sure, 